The most difficult situation when I was up there was like we had a fire in 2020 of the hotel. And I remember like looking at the fire and thinking about the story about Edison, you know, like when he called his kids to come look at the fire and like Amor Fati. And it was very, like very useful in those moments to kind of keep going. And so I think that like living in the town during that period of time, there was almost no escaping stoicism. <laughs> We should start at the beginning, which is how we came to meet each other. You applied to be my intern, yes, right? Probably what 2012, maybe 2011. I think it would have been 2011 because 2011. trust me, online hadn't come out yet. It, yeah, I think it was 2011. Yeah, the I think I was still working out yet. The, the first book I worked on was Trust Me Online. Yes, 11, 13 years ago. Yes, it's crazy. It does seem crazy, <laughs> and I think it's funny because like. Like mostly uh, internships don't go anywhere, like on both sides, like they're a dead end for the intern. And yeah. then like most of the time, like when you hire interns, it's like you're doing your friend's kid a favor and it just doesn't work out. Like it, it goes nowhere, but I feel like it worked out a little bit for you. I'd say very well, you know, <laughs> sitting here now, book on the way. Um, it's been crazy, it's been a wild journey and I have, say in the back of the book, but I'm very appreciative of all your guidance oh, over the years. The You're in the acknowledgements. Yeah, you gotta check it out. Uh, that's like the weirdest part to write. Like, I get it, that that one, that Harvard president who was accused of plagiarism, Yeah, she like, partly, she like, uh, plagiarized the acknowledgements. But I get it, it's so cringe to do the acknowledgements on yeah. something. She was probably like, that's good, I'll just do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I don't think it counts. Like, I don't think, <laughs> like, uh, the, the scandal aside, I feel like you can't, it's like, you can't plagiarize like a greeting card. Also, can you like can you edit acknowledgments as like your feelings towards people change? Does that work? Or... Okay, so I'm doing the ten. <laughs> I'm doing the ten year anniversary of of obstacle. Right, and it's this tension between um, leaving stuff as it was, like pure in that moment, like right. for the book itself, and then also the acknowledgments. Right, um, because I was grateful to that person in that moment. <laughs> <laughs> and I remain grateful, but my view of them has changed. So it's like it's like my my appreciation for what they did for me is still there. Um, the flowery language with which I describe them <laughs> is is demonstrably untrue. Yes. Subsequently. Well, I, wonder, I imagine there's people since that you want to acknowledge that have helped the book significantly, potentially more than the people that were included initially. You know, I actually didn't think and about that. And can you that. add in people to that, the acknowledgments? I think you can definitely add people into yeah. the acknowledgments. But, but yeah, taking that's, them away. Right. Like the acknowledgments are dated to everyone who's helped you with the project up until like this is the launch day for your book. Right. right? Yep. So like the acknowledgments, first off, you have to finish writing them. You can do it late in the process, but like at some point the book is locked. Yeah. And other stuff happens. But that it the acknowledgments are are true up until that exact point and no point further. Even okay. though yeah, if I don't know, if some some person gets behind the book and makes it a huge hit, yeah. they would be integral to its success, but you would not Right. Really. Like if it becomes a movie, do you think like the movie producer do, you know what I'm saying? To like making it into a movie or whatever you do. Well actually I was talking to Michael Dell uh and I asked him if he recorded his audiobook. Yeah. And he was like, I actually did. I just he's like, I wanted to do it. And he was like, there was this funny story where he uh was finished and then he started to record the acknowledgments and the guy was like, We don't record acknowledgments in audiobooks. And he was like, On this book we do. Wait, and, I did. Yeah. Well he was, was like, he was like <laughs> he was like, I feel so grateful to the yeah, people. Yeah. Like I'm not, not gonna thank him in this. Right. And I, I thought back, I don't know if I've recorded the acknowledgments of all of my books. Yeah, I didn't get clear instructions because I also recorded my book down in the mine, which we can get into. Um, yeah. So there was no producer on the line. Yes. I was kind of just winging it. So I recorded mine. And, and by to. down in the mine, you mean how many feet below Earth? 900 feet underground <laughs> in the potential, in the former largest silver mine in California. That's insane. Um, but yeah, so so I think I've started doing it because it was true. It's like, why, why not take the extra effort? I, I guess maybe I thought before, like, I already wrote it down. It's in the book. Right. It's a little weird to do it. And then maybe I was like, uh, what if I mispronounce someone's name? Or I, then I, if I'm reading it and I skip someone, is it weird? I, I Maybe I was self-conscious about it. But I do remember I, I thanked my dog by her nickname in one of my books, like yeah. maybe Obstacle. And like several years later, like a, a translator for some 
relatively obscure language emailed me and they were like i'm currently translating you know uh your there i i'm doing you know your book for the country of uzbekistan or something and i need to know what the name mcpuppin stuff means <laughs> or i need to know what the word McPuppin stuff means and i was like uh that's yeah really good uh that's just uh what we sometimes call my dog yeah um that's funny no but it feels like i mean that feels like an eternity ago both like uh in terms of actual life and then like all of this story is like 10 percent of 30 yes. percent of that yeah story like since you since you and i met yeah yeah i mean we were both living in new york were no was i i think i was living in new orleans you were in I'm, new york you had a little apartment i remember i got your couch you remember like you gave me like your this was later but i think i hired you when i was living yeah, in yeah new you, did, you did you I was did i still because yeah, yeah. uh i moved there after the book came out that's true yeah, I do remember you showed up in a in a like a man a, with a van, a van, and took <laughs> yeah all my all my uh, furniture when I moved back here, and then you came here right, and then didn't leave right. Uh, so yeah, that was funny. Do you re- like why? Do you remember why you applied? Like, do you remember what you were trying to do? Yeah, because I, I went to school for finance, so I yeah. just graduated from Columbia with a master's in real estate development. So I thought I wanted to do real estate development. I, work, I got a job at a bank and it just sucked. It was kind of like one of those things where I went to dinner outside of Chicago and I remember sitting at the dinner and like every way around me was five years older. Yeah. They're all just very, really miserable. It's one of those things where you very much can see your future in front of you. So uh-huh. I quit, traveled, came back. My only goal was to like not work at a bank. And so I remember like <laughs> at the time I was like, well, not just that, but also like be more creative in my work. Yeah. And so the posting was on Twitter, I believe. And so it was on Twitter. And so I remember I was following you and somebody that you knew. And so like I was reading that, Mm -hmm. applied. And then I remember at the time, like you were the young whiz kid, right? Because you were like 22, 23. And everyone's like, he's the director of marketing in American Real. I was like, damn, that guy's pretty smart. And so I figured it was a great opportunity to learn a bunch. I was living, to set the stage more, I was living deep in Brooklyn in Bed-Stuy in a uh, four-bedroom apartment that I was sharing with five people. So I was paying like $400 a month. To basically live where I was. I there. thought it was a. Didn't you turn it into a hostel? Eventually, or yeah, yeah. Eventually, we turned the extra rooms, put bunk beds in, turned it into a hostel to like save money, basically. And so that was paying my rent. That's kind of how I was existing in New York, and that's why I was able to work, essentially, like for like very little money, you know, yes. early on. Um, and I think that like, when I think back of, I really thought it was exciting, kind of the storytelling you guys were doing around press, because the idea was, let's not just do radio press. Let's like, do interesting things that get enough attention to bring a lot yes. of press towards it. And I remember that just being very exciting. And I remember also on the time, I was spending a lot of time on Reddit because I was like sitting mm-hmm. in my apartment. And I remember like I understood Reddit in maybe a way that like you guys didn't at the time. And I remember that was kind of like a foot in the door. I was like, oh, I'll show you guys how to like utilize this tool in a little bit better way. Yeah, it's interesting though. You mentioned that dinner where you like see someone you don't want to be. Yeah. That's like a very powerful experience. I had one of those. I was at this conference in New York City that I'd come to a couple years in a row. And I, 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 I was in marketing and most marketing people would like dress well, right? It's like a client business. And it's like, I I actually felt like I did marketing and I feel like these people like had meetings where they just like right. sold people on stuff that they couldn't actually deliver. And so I remember I'm going to this conference and I'm sort of the only one not in a suit or the only one not dressed nice. And I worked in American Apparel, so I was just wearing American Apparel clothes. And then I came back the next year, and it was the same thing. And I remember maybe the third year I sort of went, if, I keep coming here, I'm going to end up in a suit. Meaning like I would get poached and work at one of these. I would just, you can't work in a scene or an industry and be like an outlier for very long. It eventually wears you down and you become, there's an Epictetus thing about how like if you put two lumps of charcoal next to each other, one of them is lit and the other is not. the unlit one will either extinguish the lit one or the lit one will light the unlit one. Yes. And so you'll you'll either get destroyed or you'll be absorbed. Yes. And you sort of sense that and then you either um, pretend you didn't sense it and let it happen or you have to blow up your life. Yeah. I think for me it was like it was very close cool. in like Gurney. Illinois, which is outside of Chicago. I remember the bank even was like, oh, you're going to go to Chicago. So they're yeah. lying to me. I wasn't going to Chicago. I was going like to some suburb. You were flying to Chicago. I was flying to Chicago. <laughs> yeah. I was going to Gurney to do due diligence consulting, which is like digging through boxes of papers. 
And like everybody posed this as the job to get in school, right? Because yeah. I was going to school, I was paying a lot of money. And then at that table, we were at one of those, you know, like outliers in a strip mall. Yeah. It must have been like a chili or something similar to yeah. that. And everybody just was like waiting for their two for one margaritas. And I was like, no, this is it. Like yeah. When I get back to New York, I'm never doing this ever again. And that was kind of like my promise to myself. And like pretty shortly thereafter, started working with you on the marketing stuff. And Did I, you have a bunch of debt though? Still paying for it. Yeah. Still, <laughs> still, I mean, literally to this day, I still have a student loan debt. And so it was, I mean, it cost like a hundred grand to go to yeah. Columbia for the, the time. And I didn't have any scholarships or my parents weren't helping me. So I just got student loans. And then it was a difficult decision to make. And I remember going back, I started first writing articles for like a credit card.com or something for like $5. Of just things you could freelance for. Anything I could right? do yeah. that I could do for my house just yeah. to not go back into that bank. Um, and here we are. Isn't it kind of crazy though? Okay. So like obviously uh, spending all the money you have in the world to buy a ghost town is insane. Sure. At, uh, reckless, ridiculous, totally irresponsible. You could go down the list of all the things, but at 18 years old, uh, taking on as much debt as a house uh, by the way, debt that can never be discharged, right? Um, for an industry that you know nothing about, like to get it to potentially get a job in an industry you know nothing about, that by the way is shrinking or most people are wildly unhappy in, that is not only considered to be sane, it's encouraged, it's, right. in, it's, it, it's expected, and in some cases, like, backed by the security of the government yeah and it was like for me growing up both my parents were teachers so yeah. it was almost prescribed like you will go to graduate school it's just like what are you going to choose and it's like yeah. doctor lawyer banker mm -hmm. and i was like oh banker sounds good and like you are you're supposed to choose on this premise that you've made up in your mind that you've been i like i would see gordon gecko on a movie yeah. i was like that looks cool I was yeah. like, it's not cool and yeah, so yeah. You, know. you don't know he's actually uh, the villain. Yeah, exactly. He's yeah, actually, it's not cool at yeah, all. Yeah, that, that he, no, actually he's way cooler and better than most yeah. of the people in the thing. That's actually boring. And eventually know. once you get into the trap, it's I had to live with five other people deep in Brooklyn, you know, to not work at the bank. So yeah. it's kind of like that path gets set by a pretty innocent decision when you're young. And some yes. people never get out of that path. It's yeah. like set for life, basically. Well, but it... it feel then when you want to do something big or crazy they're like that's big and crazy you can't do that and and you don't realize you've already done something big and crazy totally. i think where i got lucky dropping out of college was not obviously all the opportunities that came along with it were were great and uh grateful for them but it's it's that i blew up my life and nothing bad happened yeah. was like actually the most important thing so then you know five years later or whatever when I decided I wanted to be a writer walking away from a, you know, running marketing at a publicly traded company. Um, it didn't seem that great. Like I'd done that before. I, I knew the rhythms of like, you're going to tell people and they're going to be like, what? Mm -hmm. And it's going to seem scary. And you know, you, but, but you've done it. It's like when you've started a company, then starting another company, even right. if that one fails, you've done the thing before. Right. And so you're not doing it for the first time. I think as you do more of those things too, you surround yourself with people that do those types of things. Yes. And so your surroundings change. Like before, everybody in my surroundings was going to graduate school. Yes. And then after I started doing something different, I started meeting more people. And so it's a little bit more comforting to do it the second or third time or fourth time. That's like true. That. You find you you meet people who have done even crazier yep. things, and uh, who you're like, well, I'm not doing anything that risky. <laughs> you know, like it makes it makes what you're doing actually seem like pretty tame or yeah. conservative and then you're like oh like i and and then also you just you just get older and you have more experience and your understanding of like what is like a hard left turn yeah. changes yeah. you're like okay you're taking a sabbatical that's not that crazy <laughs> you know or whatever totally yeah um yeah it's weird it's weird too because that was also kind of early on sort of like remote work and mm -hmm. living where you want and making your like that i i didn't remember a lot of people doing stuff like that yeah almost nobody i remember like even to this day from my graduating class i don't know anybody that really works in that type of capacity like the majority really? of my friends i grew up in like suburban tampa mm -hmm. and so it's like most of them are selling insurance you know they're pretty yeah. standard kind of blue chip type of jobs that they would get into um but eventually like I, there is some satisfaction in being the person who's not doing that within your group too. You sure. Know? I mean, like going back home and being like, wow, you know, like sure. 
I, I don't know. Something like that is going to be. Do you, because I, I, I think you are a good example. Like, uh, I don't remember paying you like anything. <laughs> I, I have the just... first check actually still. It was one hundred dollars for a month, so I have a one hundred dollar check signed by Ryan Holiday. I do, and I do. <laughs> I I actually okay. I actually do remember this because I think I'd never done any of that. I never had my own company before. Yeah. And I remember like the checks were connected to the wrong bank account, which didn't have any money in it. And I think they they subsequently bounced. Um, <laughs> and, not that I didn't have a hundred dollars, but I just like I was yeah. so green myself. Like I didn't know how to do any of that stuff. Yeah. Right. So it's like figuring it all out. But it is like the point is like, you know, working for someone for free or taking up an apprenticeship or like just taking a flyer, being like, I just want to like be in the scene where this stuff is happening. It it obviously is crazy and it usually doesn't work out, but it is also one of the best ways to figure out how to do stuff and build like a career and a portfolio and to actually like do stuff. Yeah, I mean, you have to be around that scene, you know, no matter yeah. what that scene's going to be. And I think like Stephen Presto talks about it a lot. Robert Green obviously talks about it a lot. And so for me, I didn't know exactly what the scene was that I was getting into. Yeah. But pretty early on, I remember us going to some author conferences and meeting like Michael, maybe like Michael Ellsberg, or, you know, some type of author. Yeah. And like, oh, this is like- Was that my book launch? An interesting crew. Yeah, your, your book launch yeah. in New York. And so thinking like, oh, these people are confirmation that there is a different type of life out there, you know? Yeah. And also it was interesting because for me, I don't even know if I told you this. So two pretty important moments. When I first moved to New York City, when I got my first job, my best friend in the world gave me the 48 Laws of Power. Oh. And he's like, you're living in New York now. Like, you need this book. And this is wow. 2011. Yeah. And I was like, all right, I need this book. I remember reading. I was like, wow, that's good. And then after I quit the banking, I went to travel for six months. Yeah. And my other best friend from growing up gave me a, a pirated copy of the 4-Hour Workweek oh. of, like, LimeWire. Yeah. And I was like, oh, like, there's another way to live here. Like, sure. you can you know, whether the methods are still applicable today, like the mentality yeah. behind it is really cool. And then within six months, I was working with Robert and with Tim. And I was like, whoa, like yeah. full circle moment. And now to think that like Robert's on the front cover of the book that I wrote. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, no, the the important thing is you're trying to sort of break out in a career or a life is there's a, Lyndon Johnson said, you have to be, you have to become close to the people at the center of things. Yeah. Like you have to, you have to meet the people that are doing the thing, not necessarily that you want to do. Like, I don't think I knew I, I think it took quite a while for me to give myself permission to want to be a writer, Sure. but I loved books yeah. and I loved writing. And so I just wanted to be like close to writers or authors or the industry. And so I was sort of drawn towards that and then marketing was the thing that they knew the least about mm -hmm. that I could teach myself the fastest and then was also like the most valuable currency in that world. Sure. And so it's like if you want to be a record producer or you want to be a you like you're drawn towards music. Like you got to get yourself a job like sweeping floors at a record studio uh, or uh, production facility because you don't even realize the jobs you don't know exist. Yeah. You're like, oh, wait, there's a person that just does that. That's right. awesome. And then maybe you meet that person and they're like, let me show you how to do it. You, you just want to be like in the room where it's happening and then you can refine from there. But if you're not, if you're just on the outside, you're just making stuff up, you're guessing, yeah. you're, 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 you're just, it's got to start there. Well, what I think is interesting is like, not just getting into the room, because a lot of people can get into the room, but it's like then leaving the room to do your own thing. Meaning like how many mm. people that want to become musicians stay A and R's for their whole life? Because yeah. they never can, like for you, you could have stayed Robert's assistant forever, sure. you know, or you could have done these things. So like, I think the first step is getting in the room, but then it's like, what are you taking away from that? And like, how are you kind of creating your own path from that? That's true. I, so but, I, but I mean, maybe you actually do love A&R and that's your yeah, thing. Yeah, no, totally. And, and, and you just didn't, you, you love music, but but maybe actually you're not cut out to be a musician or you're afraid of being, a, there's, there could be all these things that are why totally. that's not for you. But like, you just start by like, what you don't do is go get as far from the room as possible, yeah, which is get into a different room right. that is a classroom. No, I, I'm yeah. still agreeing with that. I think yeah. that like, first step is it's very hard to get in the room. And then I think what's interesting is like, then leaving the room. So for instance, like you with Robert doing yeah. your own thing, or even like Sarah Gordo in a way, yeah. that was like learning everything I could about marketing, you know, having this background in hospitality, 
and then trying to combine them, as Robert would say, into like your life's task or whatever it would yes. be. So how can you combine your own skills into a unique way? And well, the I way think to think, that, yeah, it's like you're accumulating skills and experiences and relationships um, for that moment where you get tapped on the shoulder or you catch something out of the corner of your eye and you're like, that's my thing. Right. Or that could be really cool. Right. And now you're actually qualified to do something with yeah. that thing. Um, but yeah, I was talking to Cal Newport in here the other day and we were talking about how like, yeah, you want to get in the room. And then the first step is like people, first off, people don't put themselves out there enough, take the risk to get in the room. Then they get in the room and they're kind of lazy or entitled or they're crazy or weird or they don't work hard, yeah. you know, all those things. So you get tossed out of the room. Yeah. Then there's this other thing where like, they're basically like, I don't want to say too good in the room, but it's more like they're, um, they're, they're not showing the promise required or the initiative to get to be too good for the room. Like what I mean is, is like, it was very clear, very early that like, you were not going to be my intern for very long and that you, you have to promote that person up or give them more responsibility or you lose them. Right. And that's like, that's a really critical part of that process. Like right. you have to show, like, I think people think mentorship is this thing that you like humbly submit to, which it is, but it's also like, you're kind of, it's more like you're this, this bit of energy and there's like heat seeking around, like, you know, like, totally. like the, the Sheryl Sandberg has a quote about like, don't like, get a mentor and you'll do well it's like do well and a mentor will find you yeah you have to show that like oh this person has promised compared to all like the the record studio that we're talking about it's like they have 50 interns right 49 of them like nothing they're not going anywhere and they're just doing some small tour of duty yeah and then one of them is like this kid is worth investing in yeah, something I've been thinking about a lot is like how when you said like out of your corner eye you see your thing that's gonna become your thing. Like yeah. how do you identify that? Because I remember you and I had this specific car ride. You might not remember this. I do. They're like we were driving back from San Antonio, a Spurs game. Yeah, and I remember we were like, oh, you're like very good at thing. This was probably six years ago, seven years ago, and you're like, well, what's your thing? You know, and you were kind of like you have a lot of skills. You've done a lot of different things, but like what is gonna be like? Where are you gonna apply all of these skills? Basically, yeah. in a way. And then probably like a year and a half later, Sarah Gordo came up. And really? so like, I kind of noticed that. And I don't know that it was necessarily directly based upon that conversation, but I like something that I think that people are probably listening to are like, they're in that room, you know, they have the skills. And so like, they're wondering, I get asked this a lot, like, how did I find this passion? How did I dive everything into there? So I'm wondering what you think of like, how you identify those and how do you know, like when that's the thing to make the jump into, you know what I mean? Yeah, you just sort of know, like, I, how did I know that it was my time to write a book and that that was my first book. I don't know, but I really knew, you know, like I really knew I, I had, I, I'd had other book offers that had other book ideas. Right. But then I'd read this, I'd read this book by Upton Sinclair called the brass check. And, and it was like just a different, it, it was just a, this unique book that was, I was like, Oh, he's doing like an expose of the media of how the system works and i was like i have a ex similar experience of this other world like i could do yeah. a book like that yeah and then i remember looking going like has someone else done this like is uh, is it does that exist because if it sometimes you have ideas and you realize like oh it's already been done or right. there's all these reasons but it's it's when you have that fl flutter of excitement or connection and then you look around and you go oh this is like open territory and then you just go I I think this is my thing. And, yeah. and you ask, I mean, you ask around and you go, is this crazy? Is this stupid? Right. And, and, and hopefully you've cultivated at this point, people who actually know, you know, not like kids who went from high, went to high school with, but yeah. other people who have, who Done are things. further along in that path. And they go, hey, that's actually, a, that's actually a good idea, you yeah. know? Um, and so, yeah, I think for me, it was this sense later that I was always going to be a writer, but I needed what my first book was. That makes sense. Yeah. I think for me, I was always like, I've always had an interest in hospitality and buildings. Yeah. I went to school for real estate and yeah. I tried to go to architecture school. It didn't work out. I had to drop out. It's too hard. And so like with Sarah Gordo, it was kind of a similar thing. You know, like I had this idea, this background in marketing and storytelling. And so like this abandoned mining town in the West that like kind of triggered those childhood memories of, you know, my grandfather watching Gunsmoke and all this. Imagine like hospitality plus storytelling equals. But it's weird. I don't place. remember you mentioning any of the like, I, <laughs> like the Western I don't, stuff. I don't remember you mentioning the Western stuff. I don't mention remember you mentioning like 
doing dangerous, terrifying things. Like, <laughs> you, like in retrospect, you're clearly, I think, a bit of an adrenaline junkie. Sure, of course. And you like building stuff with your hand. There were all these things that must have, I mean, I'm not saying you made them up, they, but they must have been like somewhat latent inside you. That, yeah. And they were unlocked once you found yourself in this world. Yeah, I think that like a lot of it was early childhood stuff, like being in rural Florida, like building stuff, building sand castles and all this type of stuff and like wearing West, like boots all the time. And then like being pushed into that path like we were talking about before, like, becoming a banker, you know, having the life of New York City. And then I think that this is kind of like a, oh, that's cool. You know, this is an exciting thing that I could go down. Well, Robert Greene talks about that because people ask, uh, how do I like find my passion right. or my life's task? And I think his answer is a really good one, which is that you don't find you don't find it. You already found it, yeah. and then you covered it up, and you you turned away from it because it was irresponsible or weird or uncertain right. or dangerous right. or, or whatever. Right. And it's and so he's saying it's really about going back to your childhood and this thing that lit you up. And you have a story in the book, which I remember when you told me for the first time. You, you were scuba diving with your grandfather or your father or someone? Uh, my neighbor up in New York. Yeah, yeah. You, were, you were scuba diving and you discovered like an anchor from a ship from a naval battle in 1812. Yeah, the world. And, yeah, and, and it goes in this museum. But you, so you, you had this like life-changing incredible moment. Like right. if that was the only thing someone did in their life, that would be a pretty cool accomplishment. They're just like an insurance salesman who once found like a rare naval anchor right. uh, artifact that's in a museum. That'd be pretty cool. Right. And you had that at like 12 years old. And then you were just like, but obviously this can't be a job, be my life. Yeah, you can't yeah. make a living from it. But now like I do make a living adventuring. So that's pretty. And that's finding pretty, stuff yeah, exactly. deep underground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Finding yeah. stuff deep underground. So it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. So yeah, you, so I think it's, it's important that people understand like you, Chances are you already found it. Yeah. You already know what it is. You've been denying it or dismissing it. And you have to, like, what was that thing that you just, I, I, you were obsessed with that you turned away from? And it, and weirdly, I think in the development of your brain, as I understand it, when, like, so, you know, kids, like, they have all these, um, they know all these facts about dinosaurs and tractors and whatever. Yeah. Well, as you get a little bit older, like, as you leave being a toddler, your brain has this process where it forgets a bunch of stuff. Okay. Like, so your your mind had this ability to latch onto something that was interested, interesting to you and learn everything you can about it. Right. And then as you got, as you started to develop, your brain's like, well, we can't keep all this stuff. Yeah. And so you discard it. It's like even in the movie Up, you know, there's that, or not in the movie, in uh, what is it? Uh, Dawson, what's that movie, the Pixar movie about emotions? Yeah, in the movie, you know, in, in the movie Inside Out, there's yeah. this like giant graveyard of like memories and facts. Like her imaginary friend is in there. All right. this stuff you just you just throw it all out to become like regular. And right. so I think really like finding that like life's task is is more in kind of an an unearthing or an inward exploration as opposed to just like. Oh, I'm going to audit a bunch of classes in my college and try to find something. Yeah, and I also think eventually, like, you kind of decide on your purpose, I think, like, yeah. in some way. It's like, it's not going to decide you. Eventually, like, at Cerro Gordo, it was like, oh, this is good enough. But, like, I mean, Ro Mark Manson talks a little bit, like, comfort and commitment, you know? And so mm -hmm. it's kind of like, eventually, you have to commit to, like, something. Like, what are you going to do other than pinging from thing to thing to thing? I think yeah. early on, that's easy to, like, or it's good to kind of pick up a lot of different skills here and there. But I think that, like, eventually at Cerro Gordo, I was like, you know what? This is it. This is, like, what I would like to spend my life on. And for me, there was, like, like almost a deep breath out because it wasn't what's the next project, what's the next project, what's the next project, you know? It's like, oh, this is the project. And I think that like I removed a lot of the mental energy of trying to think of what's next, what's next, what's next. Kind of. But don't you think like at some point you could have got a better paying job than working for me or like I, I, I see, I could see you having jumped ship earlier and it going very differently for you. Not that I'm responsible for it, but I just I mean like, like, I think what can happen is like, you get this opportunity, someone gets this opportunity and they're going, but like, for me, I was working for Robert Greene, I was working in American Apparel, I wrote this article about stoicism. I had a chance to write a book about that when I was like 22. Right. But the decision to not do that, to stay in the kind of development phase and to keep learning right. and the financial hit that went with that and the ego hit with that. I wouldn't be here if I had if I had taken the leap then. Totally. So what, what made you take the leap when you did then, you know? I just, I mean, I had, I'd 
put in a lot more time. Yeah. I felt like I was more ready. And then also life had kind of chosen for me because like I'd come to the end of that road. Instead of yeah. jumping early, yeah. I let it kind of take it as far as it was going to go. Yeah. I think, I think although something that you did that a lot of people have this myth that they like need to fully jump into the passion and cut all ties, you know, like burn sure. the boats. But like you still maintained your job for a while or being That's an true. author. I still, you know, maintain a job while doing Sarah Goro. So I think that like a lot of times people write me now after Sarah Goro, they're like, oh, I quit my job and I bought a castle. I'm like, no, like, yeah. please, God, no. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Th- I still maintain like a job that like I enjoy that keeps me s- mentally stimulated. That, like there is a lifeline. It's not that all the chips are pushed into one thing, you know? No, no, that's totally true. You You can experiment and build up a viable alternative and you should build up the viable alternative with as much like time and space and like what, what's that uh opm other people's money you want to do as <laughs> right. much as you can right. with other people's money totally and just at least like it buys you the freedom to experiment a little bit more i think yeah yeah i'm just like you worked for me for a lot like it, so if we met in 2011 and when did you buy Cerro Gordo? 2020 to nine years later. Yeah. Nine years. And so it was like a nine years of learning, understanding, seeing opportunities. Cause I, there was other crazy properties that came up in that past time. There was like lighthouses. I really was obsessed with this lighthouse for a while. Yeah. Weren't you, you told me once you were going to like buy a ranch and turn it into a place for like bachelor parties or yeah, something. I thought that, yeah. I mean, I still think it's a great idea. <laughs> uh, and so, and then there was like the hotel in upstate New York that I was looking at. Yeah. And so there's a lot and none of them were like fully grabbing me and holding me. And so Why I think that there was, I just think that like, there wasn't anything that I could do there and maybe that nobody else could. And I think that the storytelling around Cerro Gordo was something that like, I felt like I could do pretty good. I understood at that point this channel was going, you know, um, a lot of stuff that I've been learning at Daily Stoic is happening. And so it felt like, oh, like this could be applied to right. Ghost Town, which has inherently more interest than, let's say, a ranch for bachelor parties outside of Austin. And so it seemed like there was a whole other level there that like maybe I could contribute that I couldn't contribute anywhere else. That's an interesting point because, yeah, I, I guess I would have worked on enough projects and platforms and people's stuff and probably given them advice that that could have worked that they didn't listen to so many times that by the time sort of the idea for the Daily Stoic book, but then like an email list and all this other stuff, I was like, I think I was at a place where I was like, I was tired of doing it for other people or watching other people not do it. That I was just like, all right, this is going to be my thing. Instead of instead of being the consultant, right. I'm going to be the creator. And and so yeah, you kind of. But but I think about all the lessons that again I learned with other people's money or other people's projects that allowed me to start so far ahead when I was launching the daily. So the, there's any number of mistakes that I could have made that would have sunk it before it even started. Yeah. That because I done it on a small scale all these other times it was yeah. different i think in this case like there wasn't another guy out there rebuilding a ghost town that i could yeah. not necessarily so it had to be a leap, little bit of a leap of faith a, a big leap of faith but i knew that like i do have a skill set and so like if there's qualified people like i have a degree in real estate i have a background in storytelling you know what I'm no saying? i mean like you'd started the daily stoke youtube channel yeah and the and you'd built the daily stoke social account you had built other things for other people so then when you you were not like how do you do this? No, totally. You know, you you had you had done that, and, and and actually, like, I mean, now it's huge, but you've done it at a big scale, right? So yeah. you learn like lessons that you don't learn until way on in your like. For me, I you know, I'd I'd been on so many calls with publishers yeah. that when I did my first book, I knew it was bullshit, yeah. and I knew what wasn't. I knew what to ask for. I knew what didn't work. You know. Um, and, and so I was just starting with a store of knowledge that allowed me to to make my stuff a success faster and then also avoid the pitfalls. Yeah. So, okay, so you, I remember, so it was almost exactly four years ago. I moved to Cerro Gordo, yeah. Well, yeah, I called you because it was like everyone were just like in lockdown. I remember I was sitting on my porch and you were like, I think I'm going to make a run for it. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, what? <laughs> Uh, I think I'm going to make a run for Sarah Gordo. Um, but actually, I'm forgetting. First, I remember, I was. this is a couple years before, I remember it was kind of late and I was upstairs working in my office at my ranch and you were like, hey, I'm going to buy this ghost. I, I think I'm about to buy this ghost town. Are you in? <laughs> Do you remember what I said? 
I think you said there's a bunch of ghost towns for sale. This isn't a good idea or something to that effect. Well, I think I think I remember sending you a, a link to a lot of different ghost towns for sale. Right? That well, no, what I remember, <laughs> yeah, I I I rem- because yeah, every couple years yep. there's like a popular viral article about like ghost town for sale. Yeah. It's like a thing real estate agents know. Um, but I remember I sent you that Randy Jackson meme where he goes, that's going to be a no from me, oh, dog. Yeah, dog. That's yeah, my yeah. answer. I was like, it was like hard pass. <laughs> Seems I, like a terrible idea. I do. I was like already deep. Like I probably hadn't told you at that point. I had already like wired over earnest money. I oh, already really? like wired like $50,000 over to the real estate agent. And I was just desperately trying to like get the rest of the money together because I didn't have it. And so um, I think though, like, Eventually, some other mutual friends of ours got involved, and then I think you guys took a second look at it, and then yes. that and then it all kind of worked out. But no, no, I I did I did invest. <laughs> I, I I do remember asking for somewhat preferential terms because I also knew what it was going to cost. I think I invested for two reasons. One, I I did ultimately think if anyone could do it, you could do it. But I also knew what it would cost me uh, in terms of like phone calls and like, yeah, advice. exactly. Yeah, exactly. Totally. So it's like, I might as well participate. <laughs> yeah. Like it's our, the opportunity cost of, of this is already enormous for me because it's going to take your eye off the ball from yes. all the other stuff that we do together. Um, <coughs> but you paid me back because even though you bought a fucking ghost town uh, with money, you didn't have if requiring skills, you didn't have when I was like, Hey guys, uh, I think I'm going to open a bookstore. Yeah. You're like, terrible idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely going to fail. Yeah, Don't I do it. I was, yeah. I remember like physical locations are terrible. You're going to yeah. lose your shirt. You, Don't do it. Yeah, you were You were like, you were very adamant and spent, like you gave me a lot, like a very long argument about yeah. how miserable it would make me. How would I think I called it like, it's going to be a prison of your own making. <laughs> yeah. I was like, this, you're making your own prison. It's going to be a, I always used to describe like, I had the hostels of like a beautiful prison. You're going to make it really pretty, but you're always going to be stuck there. Um, but look at us now. Who would have thought? <laughs> I do. That, that That is an interesting thing. So, you, you know, you get advice from people and they mean well, but you quickly realize they have no idea what the fuck they're talking yeah. about. Like you and I were standing in the ghost town with another person we've worked with before. And I was sort of, I was like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm excited. I was like pitching it. I was trying to get both of you involved. And, uh, and he goes, the build out of this thing, at least 500 grand, <laughs> yeah, you totally. know? And I go, Oh man. I remember I went home and I was like, so down about, it. I was talking to Samantha. I was like, we can't spend that. That's crazy. And she was like, why don't you like get a bid? Like yeah. she, she was like, why don't we think about what we actually want to do? Yeah. And then get a bid for that. Right. And it was like, Forty thousand dollars, <laughs> like not half a million dollars, but yeah. less than ten percent of that. Yeah, because um, people are thinking when people are giving you advice, they're usually thinking, uh, not is it a bad idea generally, but like, is it a bad idea for them? Yes. So like, even when I was like ghost town, like I don't want to live in a ghost town. I have kids and a life. Yeah. And I like stability and normalcy. You have a very different lifestyle and approach than me. You, you know, I don't have normal or stability. Not at all. You are already living in, you are already living in, uh, in, in uh, I don't want to say filth, but you are, you are, you are already living it. You already lived. Uh, I think you've said this before that you are a slumlord to yourself. Yeah. I never, I don't like to spend money. Yeah. So it's like you, you were already not, you were already not like living easily. So like for me, I'm thinking here I am, Here's what it would be. And right. you were so much closer to that thing. So, sure. but, but the point is, like, if I had listened to that advice, yeah. it would have deterred me from doing it. But the advice was not what I was going to do. And I remember one of the things I did as I went and I was like, well, what are these saying? Like, and, and I, when I looked online, it was like other people were like, oh, yeah, it costs 500000 to a million dollars to start a bookstore. Yeah. And I go, well, I'm not, that's crazy. Yeah. You know, I don't want to do that. And I can't do that. And so I was like, but what do they say? I was like, I currently have an e-commerce uh, right. like media business. Um, and I know what that cost to start, which was nothing because yeah, I right, bootstrapped right. it for nothing. And I was like, what do those same outlets say it costs to do that? Like a million dollars. Yeah, it was like $250,000. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. So these numbers are nonsense. Right. You know, and so one of the things that you can get 
sort of intimidated by is just wildly inflated or inaccurate senses of how something goes when oftentimes you're either doing something uniquely or you're doing something that's never been done before and no one could possibly tell you yeah. whether that's realistic or not. Yeah. And I think sometimes like sometimes people aren't necessarily looking for advice, you know, they're not necessarily looking for confirmation. They're looking for like a little bit of a litmus test and to kind of get feedback. I think that sometimes if you're like, if you know, it's the thing you want to do, then I don't know. There's a little bit of wiggle room there. Yeah. I mean, it is, it is, uh, it's hard though, because also the biggest failures in my life, people told me was a really bad idea and right. I should have listened right. to them. But how many people told you that obstacles away was a really bad idea? Yeah. Well, you know, wasn't there someone that told you it'd sell maybe a thousand copies? Well, I was just going to say a lot of times nobody says like, it's going to fail. Right. They go like, eh, yeah. you know, like, like they kind of damn it with faint praise, you know? Um, so it's really hard to get an accurate picture <laughs> of how something's going to do. Yeah. So yeah. someone, uh, predicted the obstacles away would sell five or 5,000 copies. I mean, my own publisher didn't think it was going to be that big. Like uh, looking at the events they gave yeah. me, like, it's but not I like... mean, did you think it was going to be that big? No. Right. Yeah. But I wasn't, but I don't think, I don't think I had any sense of how You're big open it would to be. the idea of it being that big. I thought it would be a good book to write. That's great. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like I wasn't yeah. thinking at all. Like yeah, most outcome. of the things I've done that have succeeded I had zero idea of the parts of the outcome that were sort of like quantifiable or monetizable. Right. It it was something that I was excited to do. Sure. And that part's up to you. Like yeah. you the control the, the input, not the output. Yeah, yeah, like the Stoics say, like what parts of it are up to you and what parts are not right. up to you. So like when I talk to someone and they're like, Oh, I'm gonna write a book and my goal is to sell a million copies, yeah. I'm like this I already hate this project. You know, like <laughs> totally. first off, I'm I know that it's not right because like ninety nine point nine percent of books don't even sell like uh, ten thousand copies. Yeah. Um. But you have you you didn't tell me that I should work on this book with you because it's going to be important or meaningful or nothing's ever existed like it. Or, you know, it's the result of this or that. You're like, you're already leading with like the most meaningless part of it. You know what I mean? Totally. And, and so most of the things that I've taken big risks on were motivated by something I think more pure than, than just like some quantifiable outcome. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot better ways to spend your money than on an abandoned ghost town. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Certainly. if you had bought an abandoned ghost town because you wanted to turn it into a big YouTube channel, yeah. I think it's dead in the water. Yeah. Or even like a giant resort, you know, I think that that was kind of some of the metrics moving into yeah. it. And so I think that, I don't know, the, the, the motivations are a little bit different. Like sometimes there's intangible things that you're benefiting from as well. Yeah. Well, think about it. You bought this ghost town in 2018. Yep. Right. And you don't even start the YouTube channel until mid 2020. Correct. Yeah. So two and a half years of flailing around <laughs> before it even starts to be the thing that it becomes. Right. So if if you had, you have to be open. You have to genuinely like the thing and genuinely be motivated by some kind of intrinsic motivation. Or when it in, invariably takes longer than expected you get crushed you give up yeah yeah and this is taken i mean we were hoping to get some type of overnight accommodation the first month that we I remember like i looked at my original plan i was like all right we're gonna like sweep the floors and put people in beds and then we're yeah. gonna start renting it out and now yeah. it's six years later and nobody's ever paid to stay overnight at cerro gordo yet you know it's taken a lot of different journeys and they will you know we're working on the hotel that's the hope you know um <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I don't know. So, so for I, I, we're sort of using a shorthand about it because I've been there many times and I love it, um, and I've watched most of the videos. But describe like why do you fall in love with this place? Yeah. What is it? Where is it? And why is it? Yes, Cerro Gordo is a it's a former mining town. It's about three and a half hours northeast of Los Angeles, about three and a half hours west of Las Vegas. It's in a mountain range where. To the east is Death Valley National Park, which is about six miles from us. To the west is the Sierra Nevada and Mount Whitney. So it's kind of cradled in between the lowest point in the U.S. and the highest point in the U.S. Um, they started mining silver and lead there originally in the 1860s. They mined that for about 20 years. That went bust, kind of turned into a ghost town. Another guy came back in 1910. He mined zinc there for another 20 years. 
as far as mine, I had an active life from about 1860 to 1940, which is a huge life. 80 years is crazy for a mining town. Usually they figured these would have five or eight years. And so since 1940, it sat pretty much abandoned. You know, people have tried to do different things here. They're like tours and this and that. Um, and so when I got it in 2018, when we got it, um, it was kind of like a treasure chest waiting to be opened with as far as storytelling goes and stuff, because it was an important town. You know, it's peak had 4,000 residents there. And you have to figure, to put in perspective, at that point in time, Los Angeles only had about 6,500 residents when this town is 4,000. And so there are so many interesting stories there. And then the more I dug into it, the more I dug into it, it was just like, I don't know, like a true town out of the American West and being there was amazing. I loved Westerns when I was a kid and I felt like I knew all the big towns, like yeah. Dodge City and uh, Deadwood. And yeah, and and I had never heard of Cerro Gordo. Yeah, I, I wonder if it's like, you know, Tombstone had a good movie about it, so that yeah. probably helped quite a bit. Um, but yeah, the town pulled like five hundred million dollars worth of silver out of it. So I wonder. There's a couple of things that it had against it. First, um, there wasn't a lot of record keeping, and then when they did start keeping record keeping, the county hort- courthouse in Independence, California, burned down twice and was lost in an earthquake once <laughs> during the active years of the town. So like most of the like actual storytelling history got lost in um, all these earthquakes and fires, yeah. and there's just like nothing exists. There's newspaper articles, but all the newspaper articles are. Um, unreliable to say the best. Yeah. I think Mark Twain said like a miner is just a liar standing next to a hole, which I think is a good quote. Yeah. Um, and so there's like all this to wade through. And so I think that it was just kind of got forgot over time. It was just lost. Also, it unlike a lot of the towns, there was no, there weren't like the cowboys. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because it was, it was functionally just a mining town. Yeah. And so there wasn't that kind of it's, it was hard to get to. There wasn't the the infamous shootouts at the Oka Corral because there yeah. wasn't just like the buzzing city of, let's say, uh, a tombstone that you pass through on the way somewhere else. If you're yeah. going to Cerro Gordo, you're going to Cerro Gordo for right. a purpose. And so a lot of those stories and infamous people, there was the infamous people that came through town, but it wasn't like there's rumors, all these rumors, Butch Cassidy, Mark Twain's done a lot of time in Owens Valley. So it's like probably likely that he went up to Cerro Gordo just because of his time there. Yeah. Um, but then like to me, there's people that I think have a, as interesting of life as those guys, but just weren't ever recorded or talked about. Like yeah. the owners of the town, Mortimer Belshaw, was got set it up. He got robbed a lot of times by Tiberico Vasquez, which the Vasquez Rocks outside of Los Angeles is named after. And so there's all these characters there that, if the light was shined on them a little bit more, I think have just as interesting of life and just as like important of impact into Western history that just hasn't been told. And so I think for me, like what got me fired up over the last few years is uncovering these stories, you know, putting them into the book and just trying to give a little bit more light to them. Because I think that like Belshaw could be a character like we think of when we think of these other towns or Lola Travis, the woman who owned the brothels in town. You know, she was a huge character. She had like shootouts. She had, you know, she was an entrepreneur. She had a bunch of businesses there. And so I think it's exciting to think that this history that maybe would have been essentially lost is now very much more in the public eye. And I wonder like what that will do in 10, in, no, let's say, let's do 100 years. In 100 years, will they be like, oh, yeah, the big towns in the West, Cerro Gordo, Tombstone, you know, like, yeah. will it be part of that conversation? I wonder how much of it is also its proximity to Los Angeles. There's a great book about Los Angeles called, like, A History of Forgetting. Okay. Like, you don't think of Los Angeles as a historical place. Yeah. Um, but it's just as old as San Francisco. And it's because uh, Los Angeles, you know, sort of destroys all its big Victorian mansions. Right. Los Angeles is constantly reinventing itself because of Hollywood. It's about, even though it's so often the movies are about the past, it's also this sense of the future and like sort of it's, it sees itself as a modern city, not a historical city. Yeah. And so its connection to the old West, like the, what's mind blowing to me is the, the mine, the, the silver would come down the hill of Cerro Gordo, get put in a boat, yep. go across Owens Lake than by train to Los Angeles. And so Cerro Gordo is gone. If you've seen the movie Chinatown, you understand why Owens Lake is gone. Yes. The idea of trains in Los Angeles, that's gone. Yeah. So like just every part of that has been er- like physically removed. Yeah. And so like it's it's just not part of the history of it in 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 how the state or the region understands stuff. Like Southern Southern California feels like Florida, like just yeah. the pr- like vacation, present, whatever. The fact that there were people there, like like that, uh, like I mean, some of them. There's like Adobe 
kilns where they used yeah. to to process the silver. Like it goes so far back. There's yeah. there's uh, like you know hieroglyphs and yeah. Two thousand three thousand. I mean, even before that, like even before trains were removed. You know, mules used to bring them into Los Angeles. Yeah. So the idea of mule barns being in downtown Los yes. Angeles, and the guy that was bringing the silver from Cerro Gordo to Los Angeles was a guy named Remy Nadu. And Remy Nadu opened the very first two story hotel in Los Angeles. He's the first hotel with an elevator. Yeah. It was the guy from Cerro Gordo, which eventually became, which that got torn down and became the LA Times building, which then that got torn down and remade into something else. And so now we're like three buildings removed from yeah. Cerro Gordo history. And yeah. again, like, because it's not in front of you, you can't touch it. Yes. And like the history burned down four times, you know, in the court records. I wonder if, to your point, it just kind of like got lost in the shuffle over well, time. Even like downtown Los Angeles is this sort of old artifact of a city. Yeah. And then like if when when someone says I'm moving to L.A., they're it's Santa Monica yeah, and Venice and Malibu and Hollywood. It's like so. So it's just it, it is this region that's kind of uh, has this uh, amnesia about its past. Right. Um, right down to the fact that there once was a beautiful lake. And so you can so you can understand that somebody like I worked in Stormy Helling for ten years. The idea of like bringing the dead town back to life, both like yeah. literally and like storytelling wise, is pretty exciting. Like the idea that maybe in a hundred years it is mentioned in the same breaths as all those other big towns, which I think it it could be. You know, if people do enough research. Well, it's a very it. powerful thing when you're like when you discover something yeah. and you're like, this is amazing. Yeah. I why don't more people know about it? I mean, that was my Stoicism. relationship with stoicism totally, yeah yeah. And, sense, yeah and and so yeah it seemed crazy at the beginning right and um and yet it was also it's been this explosive thing because people are having the same re when people are discovering the things i've written or the videos i make or whatever they're having that same reaction that i had so you have you if it was explosive for you when you discovered it for the first time Chances are, when you if you do a good job, and you in, you can recreate that for other people. Then you know you have this explosive thing. That's very interesting. I didn't think, but it was kind of a very similar similarities because like stoicism then was probably like with the real academics, you know, it was popular within them, and like the real desert rats out in you know the middle yeah. of nowhere would know about Cerro Gordo, and they got excited about it. But then when you can see it and maybe like apply it through a different lens and yeah. different digestible bits, suddenly now. Cerro Gordo's everywhere, stoicism everywhere, you know, it's kind of, I didn't, I didn't thought about the parallel. Well, yeah, and then you have these tools right, that exactly. didn't exist before. Totally. And so, yeah, I can watch a, a one minute TikTok of you going 900 feet underground and discovering a perfectly preserved jacket right. that's 100 years old. And you're right. like, what? Yeah, you know, yeah. or yeah, I can watch you, you know, uh, digging down on the ground and finding, you know, beer bottles that were made by hand or, you know, like it, the the little things that you that were amazing for you yeah. have the ability to be broadcast and reach huge amounts of people very quickly. Well, I think for both Stoicism and Cerro Gordo, yeah. right place at right time almost. Because like for Cerro Gordo, the old owner wanted to make it into a bed and breakfast too back in the 90s. Yeah. She didn't have social media. It never right. really worked out. Maybe she was barely scraping by, but not yeah. really. And so now like TikTok, YouTube, and they, they all come onto the scene and suddenly the tools are there, the right person's there, you know, and so suddenly these th these ideas can kind of take off Okay, so you make a run for it in yep. March of 2020. You end up in in, in uh, Cerro Gordo. I, I remember you sent me a picture. You you couldn't even drive. You drove it. Basically, the plan went sideways before you even physically got there. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, to tie it even further, I was driving your sister-in-law's former truck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that I bought truck. For I remember that. Almost yes. nothing. Yes. Two-wheel drive, base model coma packed all my stuff into it and this was at the time of the pandemic when they were talking about shutting down state borders yes. so i was like oh man i gotta get out there or i'm gonna get shut down and so yeah, yeah. i remember calling you and I'm like what if i get shut down in arizona you know yeah. like, i didn't know it was gonna happen and so i made a sprint for it. i pretty much drove straight for 24 hours the little two-wheel drive truck didn't make it all the way to town it doesn't handle snow very well after being a texas truck and so well first off when people think uh ghost towns in california i don't think they're thinking yeah snow. Yeah, so the, the when people think ghost towns, they often think like desert. We're in the high desert. So the town's at 8,500 feet in elevation. We're at the end of an eight-mile dirt road that increases a mile in elevation on the way up, which you have run, actually, which is a very difficult run. So it's a really steep mountain, twisty, turny road to get there. And at night, if you arrive, you can't see what's going on at the top of the hill. You know, you have no idea what's going on up there. And so I had no idea there was a, a blizzard essentially happening. You right, because it you you enter at what like four thousand feet. Yeah, it's normal weather. Normal weather. Yeah, totally fine. Everything looks good. Oh, great! I'm gonna get up there. I'm gonna have this adventure. I get halfway up the road. Oh, a little bit of snow. Oh, a lot of snow. And at that point, 
what are you gonna turn around and yeah. slip and slide back down the hill? And so parked the truck, packed my bag, walked into the house and <laughs> never looked back, kind of still there, still there four years later. And and the by house you mean which house do you walk in? Like yeah. there's just a couple of houses, a couple of buildings. Yeah, right? I walked into Mortimer Belshaw, the original owner of the town's his house. We're talking no running water, no Wi Fi, barely cell phone service, and so a very like call of the wild experience to get into this house and it's like going it's like going back in time time. 100 years yeah it's 150 years and so then wake up the next morning even more snows there and i i think i went out there a little bit looking for an adventure i was looking for something to happen and i was like oh well here's my adventure you know pretty much day one um and i remember very early on being excited you know i think during the pandemic was an interesting time to be there because nobody was really spending time with a lot of people everybody yeah. was socially distancing so the loneliness factor of being around in your town was not really there because like oh well, everyone's lonely so it's yeah. actually a very good time to go up there originally and then i brought up actually our camera that we used to use for daily yeah, stuff well, not used to use you <laughs> stole the daily. you had i remember we had shot we had shot something at my house like the first or second week week yeah. of march and then you'd taken the camera back to like upload the footage and then everyone was supposed to go to their s- separate quarters so you just had the daily stoic camera and you just took it was it you. stealing was it borrowing you know was it stealing if you give it back eventually i still haven't yet given it back but i one day hope to be yeah i mean does it still exist or did you no it still exists it, no, it, still exists. it oh. still exists it's not my desk at cerro gordo um and so i mean that camera is responsible for hundreds of millions of views i know which is crazy and yeah. so the the camera oh, so this place daily so is very much responsible in many ways about the training and also literally the physical camera that i used to record it and everybody up there and like I wanted to take those astrophotography. I started taking those photos of the stars. Yeah. That was, everybody during the pandemic was doing different hobbies. People started baking sourdough bread a lot, you know? And I was like, oh, I'm gonna take photos of stars. And I did really, I shared yeah. them on, but then I was also like, oh, this is an interesting experience. I'm yeah. gonna capture this. Like maybe I'll put it in a video or maybe I'll just have it for my own archive uh, to look back on the pandemic. Made a video about it, put it up. Um, first video did really well. And then I just enjoyed it, you know? Cause like, while I worked around a lot of creative people for a long time, I never had my own creative outlet. I wasn't yeah. maintaining a blog. I wasn't writing books. I wasn't making music. And so putting together a video is really interesting to me. How can you tell a compelling story throughout it? And so suddenly I had that creative outlet and I enjoyed it. And I think that I was able to mix in what I thought was interesting videos. And luckily they did pretty good. I remember you got almost immediate. So you, you get in there and then almost immediately you start getting attention because we were all born all on our yeah. phones. And it was like guys snowed in in ghost town during pandemic, yeah. which was a compelling story. But I also saw very clearly, oh, this is Brent's marketing ability. Sure. A plot like put layered on top of the fact that he's in a pretty extraordinary circumstance. Yeah, I remember like. So when I got up there, I got snowed in. And that's like, yeah. that's what happened. And it was like yeah. very difficult to be there. And I remember I was looking online and we were all bored looking at articles. And this person from the New York Post wrote this article about like how people were living shining like experiences. I was like, no, no, no. Yeah. I am living the shining experience. <laughs> yeah. I am living in a ghost town. I'm snowed in. I'm the caretaker of a hotel, you know? Yeah. And so I wrote her, I was like, hey, like I'm living in this ghost town. And I think she saw the appeal of it too. And it turned from, you know, like, oh, this is what I'm doing to man trapped having to eat you know like yeah. his own shoes to survive it got like sensationalized a little bit and then the way media does it just turned into this it had its own momentum that i couldn't almost control it was yeah. like each time it would get a little bit more removed until i remember i think it was the daily mail or some blog like that was like you know battling ghosts man is like <laughs> drinking his own blood to like survive in a time and i was like whoa like hold on and if i look back at the original email it's like hey i came up to this town that i bought yeah. It's snowing, you know, um, that might be an interesting life experience. And so kind of sometimes the media has a way of just taking it for its own ride. Yeah. Um, but again, at the end of the day, like I'm not oblivious to the fact that a guy living in a ghost town during the pandemic is interesting inherently. Yeah. And so I think that helped with the press, but also helped with the channel to get going. Well, it's this too. funny thing, like at the beginning you do a thing and nobody cares at all. Yeah. And then like, you know, you decide to write about an obscure school of ancient philosophy and then one thing one way or another and then all of a sudden the fact that it is crazy or unusual or should be not interesting is what makes it interesting yeah and then 
then you have the op now you have like more press than you know what to do with yeah. and it's 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 this it can be this sort of weird disorienting experience yeah it can kind of take on his life of its own you know i remember talking to the manager like one of the biggest music acts out there and they're like we don't do press period because like they can't control because eventually you no longer have control i think at first it's really fun and it's rewarding because you're like oh people care about my story they're telling yeah. my story but then they're like oh but i didn't say that yeah oh, but i didn't do that and then so like it takes like a little bit of leap a little bit of leap a little bit of leap and then suddenly you're like I no longer have control of the wheel. This yeah. car is taking its own ride. And so I think that like, that was a little bit of the experience during the pandemic. And I can see why certain people wouldn't do press generally. Um, well, yeah. Er, and early on, you feel validated by people totally. seeing you and talking about you. And then you go, okay, the downside is this could be really negative publicity. Yeah. And the upside is actually not, you, you get enough press hits and you see that it, other than some people seeing it, it doesn't like do anything for you. Yeah. And then you go, oh, okay, I actually don't need to do this. And then the, the discipline of being like, I'm just gonna ignore that. Like, yeah. or I'm just not gonna respond to that, or I'm, I don't actually need to do that interview. Um, that's something I have to talk, like with the Justice book coming out, I'm like, um, the publisher's like, well, here's like f all these places that would have you on. And yeah. I go, I, Every one of those is like an hour of time, at least, or two hours of time. Totally. And it's like, what could I make with that time and just talk to my actual audience or make stuff that I care about yeah. that would matter? But it's hard to say no. To it's press. a weird experience, too, because there is the ego of first when the press starts sitting. But then even with social media, even with anything like clips or whatever, you put out a certain type of clip and the initial appeal is to make more of the same type of stuff that you've done. And I think for yeah. me, at least what happens is you know, anytime you turn on a camera, inherently the room changes, whatever that law is, you know? And mm -hmm. so you put on a little bit of like a, maybe it's more peppy, maybe it's more of this. And then I think what happened with me is, you know, a year on, you kind of lose the thread of who you are and who the character is a little bit. And then it can be difficult. Or even that there is a character. That is the, a, the person that you have to become when you turn, like writing me and podcast me is different. Writing me and video me is different. Right. And then me just as a person is different than right. all of those things. I think both of us, we try, I try to be like as close to who I am in those as I can. And that, but like anybody that says it, like they're hundred percent, that's a lie. Like yeah. there is some type of character that's being performed. It's some type of performative act that's happening. Yeah. And so like, I got really like, like lost in the, what is the character? What is me? Who, what does the character think? What do I stand for? And so I think that like, if you zoom forward from that original burst of attention, it got to like a pretty, like almost dark place, or as I couldn't understand. Well, here's what how you know it's a for. it's a character. Uh, I remember at some point, like I'd seen your videos, so then we turn on the what we call the big TV in our house. That's not iPads. Sure. And and like uh, one of your videos came, like was suggested on YouTube, and so uh, Clark must have been like four or five at the time. And I was like, let's watch this, and we watch it. He gets and he's like fascinated by it. You're like rappelling down this mine. You're fine. He just falls in love with my son. Falls in love with your YouTube. Yeah. yeah. I was like, you know, you know, Brent, <laughs> like you've met Brent many times. And the idea that this person on the, the screen, TV yeah. was a real, per especially because I don't, I don't think I saw you. We didn't see each other for like a year because of the pandemic. Cause you yeah. were there and I was here. Um, it, he like, couldn't, it, it was like, I think he knew in, t it, you know, on one level that you were a person that he'd met before. Yeah. And on the other hand, there was this different person who lives on the screen. Totally. And, and that's, I mean, that's how it, that's, there is something, I don't want to say false, but there's something not real about it. Well, it's, it's for it's, all creative acts. It's that, by the, it's by definition edited, right? Yeah. Everything about it is edited. And so it's just kind of like this edited version that's existing out there. And um, it's difficult. It's difficult to like, again, to, for me to grapple with what am I doing almost <laughs> sometimes? Although I remember, so you, you get up there, you're stuck. Yep. And we were talking quite a bit. And then with Daily Stoke, we're like, we have this other business that we have to figure out. They can't like close. Yeah. We have employees and we have stuff. Yeah. And and so we decided to do that a live time dead time yeah. challenge. Yeah. Uh, the basically the the idea that the Stokes talk about is like you don't control what's happening around you, you control what you do inside of it. Um how weird was it to be trapped in a ghost town and then also making like talking about those stuff did, did the stoic ideas have any sort of extra resonance for you in the situation you're in you know, i mean all the time almost every day you know i think that like 
being exposed to so, so them for the past decade or so or working so closely yeah. with it. I mean, the, by definition, it's supposed to be something you're able to call upon in tough decisions. And up there, yeah, going through that experience where we're talking about like, remember your death. And I'm looking, <laughs> I don't know why I said yeah. like that. <laughs> we're saying like, we're talking about the practice of the like, moment yeah. Mori. And I would look up and I would see the cemetery, you know, where people were buried from the last pandemic and stuff like that. Yeah. And so it was like, right. there's a bunch of people that died of the great influenza yeah, exactly. in Saragora. Buried in the ground that I own. And so it's just like, I'm remembering, I'm remembering death. And then even, you know, and more attractive, like probably the most difficult situation when I was up there was like we had a fire in 2020 of the hotel. Yeah. And I remember like looking at the fire and thinking about the story about Edison, you know, like when he called his kids to come look at the fire and like Amor Fati and that type of stuff. And it was very, like very useful in those moments to kind of keep going. And so I think that like living in the town during that period of time, there was almost no escaping stoicism. And so it was like a good time to be both practicing it and also putting together the materials that we were putting together for the the website you sink your life savings into this project you're working on it for years and years you're starting to make some progress you just cleaned out this whole you know uh beautiful historic building that had stood for what 170 149 149 years yeah you go to bed yeah and you wake up to the heat yeah it was four of us in town at the time we gone to bed Woke up to what I thought was like firecrackers or something, but it was actually was the cans heating up so much and popping inside of the hotel. And so they're like exploding. Woke up very disoriented. No, no, what's going on. Um, somebody else was staying in the house. So he woke up and it was like, what's going on? I don't know. And so go outside. Eventually realized that the main hotel here, the main building of the whole property was on fire. Um, Try to do what we can, you know, grab water, pouring it on it, you know, just completely a mess trying to figure out what to do next. Um, it's complete loss. You know, everything goes away. I remember staying up the entire night battling the fire, talking to firefighters, all that type of stuff. And in the morning, I remember kind of standing on the porch and just like unsure what I was going to do, where I was going to go. And the old owner of the hotel or the old owner of the property had come up the night before, or that night. And he kind of like came over to me, put his hand on my shoulder and I just like kind of lost it. I was like, oh my God, this is like too much to handle. Um, and I remember he was like, you know, this is bound to happen. This is part of history now. You can't change what happened, but what happens from here is up to you. And that was a very like... That's like Stoicism 101. Exactly. He yeah. was preaching to me Stoicism in a different manner. And it wasn't like he was like, I'm going to tell you some Stoicism. This is like part of his nature. And I think in times like that, you try to grab onto something. I think that's what Stoicism is so helpful for, for people when you're in a tough moment. You need to latch onto something when your life is just going over You just high. watched your the entire future and history of the town yeah essentially everything burned to the ground yeah the centerpiece the all of our plans were poised around people gathering in the hotel that was the whole point of the whole project was that and to see it go away i was lost in every sense you know i didn't want to be there i didn't want to be anywhere else and so for him to say you know like you can't change what happens what happens here is up to you was kind of what i grabbed onto and i would repeat that phrase you know what happens next is up to you what happens next is up to you and that was just stoicism repackaged for from him um but it was the only thing that almost got me through those days during after the fire was like holding on to that phrase tightly and just remembering really his compassion in a moment where he didn't have to be compassionate, which I think was like a testament as well. You know, like he could have come up and been like, what the hell, you know, like this is <laughs> crazy. Yeah, yeah, what the hell is going on? But like for him to like express even like the slightest bit of compassion was very like profound to me and like something I wouldn't forget for a really long time. And I think that like holding on to those words that happens next is up to you is this like what got the town not just, I mean, it's not quite back to where it was because the hotel isn't finished yet, but like the community, the residents, the whole property itself is in a much stronger place, I think, than it was four years ago in many senses. It feels uh, a little, yeah, it feels weird to say like, but the video you make of the thing burning down sure. is kind of what blows the whole town up because it was so raw and authentic like when you say what happens next is up to you your decision to share and talk about sure. the worst thing that ever happened to you is weirdly what brings all these people on board both as fans and as contributors and yeah. it, it makes the story compelling like if you were scripting it right it's that's an incredibly devastating end to the second act yeah it was it was just i think that people appreciated the raw nature of it. I remember yeah. early on when we were doing the videos, I'm like a pretty private person generally. I'm pretty reserved, like a, kind of an introvert. And I remember when we were making the videos, it was like, 
I kept thinking about the Simon Sinek, you know, like people don't care what you do. They care why you're doing it. Yeah. And so you're trying to insert more why into the video. It's like, I'm exploring this mine and a thousand people have my exploration videos where they put on a GoPro and they walk through a mine and those videos get 50 views because nobody cares. But like, if I'm like, I'm exploring this mine because it's important for these reasons, it's important to me for these reasons. And you kind of explain that. And I think that the hotel gave me a moment to express why Cerro Gordo is so important to me and to like show what I was going to do about it. And I yeah. think people just re resonated with that. Yeah, it also gives you somewhere you're going, whereas before it was like, here's the town and it's staying as it is, right. more or less, right? Sure. And then for a piece of it to go away and then to have this then story about can it come back? Sure. It becomes a different story. Yeah, I mean, it was it, it was like a phoenix from the ashes kind of yeah. thing. It was kind of like really trying to, to bring something back. And I think that people were able to see me out there until midnight in a backhoe, you know, like toiling away, trying to do whatever I could to bring this place back. And I think people resonated with that, resonated with the passion that I had towards it. And we're almost there. You know, the roof's back on the hotel. <laughs> no, it's year. funny. I um, I have one in my office. I'll give it to you. But I, I was reading about this this pine cone. Is this species of pine tree? Not the, not, what's the, cone? what is that the really old one yeah, there? Cones. It's not that one. Okay. It's, um, it's, a. Uh, Anyways, the, the point is, the it's like a standard pine tree drops a pine cone. And, you know, they're all, like, really tight yeah. and green. Yeah. Um, it has to be exposed to fire to oh, yeah. unlock. Like, so it, it – it, and it won't unlock under ordinary temperatures. Like, it's only if exposed to a forest really? fire oh. that the next generation of trees, right. like the next stand of trees can come. Right. And I love the metaphor of um, – you think this is this devastating, destructive event, which it is, right. but it's actually necessary. The creative destruction is necessary for the next thing to happen. And if you don't get it, right. it can't unlock. It can't become the thing that it's meant to be. And so, yeah. yeah, you think it's supposed to be easy. You think that you want it to happen a certain way. You want to anticipate problems and eliminate them in advance and avoid them or whatever. But actually, like, you don't know what you are depriving yourself of by not well, it gives, doing it. It gives you the opportunity to come back from it, right? And yeah. so that way, like, and I think that, like, as you keep doing that, I mean, you said it before, I think you said something like, I look to evidence, I don't look to, like, will or something like that. And so... Oh, yeah, I don't believe in myself, I have evidence. Yeah, and so I think that at this point, I've, with a lot of help, have essentially rebuilt a hotel on the top of a mountain. And so that get, puts me in such a stronger place than, let's say, the last four years just went smoothly and we were yeah. building little cabins and stuff. Now it's like, what can't we do? If we can rebuild a hotel in the middle of nowhere, you know, it just kind of gives you that confidence, that evidence to point to in the future as things go wrong. Yeah, Seneca says you, you know, someone who hasn't been tested or exposed to difficulty, who hasn't been knocked down and bloodied in the ring, yeah. is actually someone to pity because yeah. they don't know what they're capable of, yeah. right? And and probably deep down that they, they suspect they're not capable of things. Yeah. And so, yeah, whatever it is that you've gone through, it's a breakup or a bankruptcy or... Um, the public humiliation or it's just the the pandemic that everyone just lived through like if you wondered if you were capable of living through adversity and difficulty the fact that you're still standing four years after this historic event happening like you should you actually do have a good sense of it and i i think in your case like fire and then the logistics of first off just living alone without running water and right uh you know all just you against the elements is is one sort of trial by fire but then then building back after a literal fire yeah you're probably it probably turns down the volume on anxiety or uncertainty when you i don't know you get a flat tire or something yeah, you're I, mean, like, like, I can solve this when i first moved out there everything was a crisis you know like yeah. oh my god this is like the door broke on the it's like, and so i think that as you figure out those small things it's like I forget it's like everything's figure outable, you know, yes. that's like, I think a very good thing. And I think that's like almost like a figure outable muscle that like you can grow as you figure out smaller things and smaller things. And at this point, you know, it started off with a porch needed to be repaired. Then a roof needed to be repaired. Now a hotel needed to be rebuilt from scratch. And now our road has washed out four or five times. So each time I'm doing that, I feel like I'm getting stronger. And these days, like the thing that stressed me out, four years ago is not even gonna come close to stressing me out, you know, whether that's anything related to the property of like the road washing away, you know, a roof flying off and that type of stuff. And I think that's just like something that if you stretch yourself a little bit of time, now I look back and I think about the time before the fire and I'm like, 
well, what was I selling my short self short on before? You know, I kind of use it as a reason to look back and being like, oh, look at how much I was possible of doing. Like, what wasn't I doing before? You know, that I could have been doing more. Yeah, I also think about like my it cha- your the change of your time horizon. So when you go through like, so like Samantha and I've been together almost twenty years now, right? So like when you're first in a relationship, you have like a couple bad days, and you're like, is this not gonna work? You know? Then you've been married a long time, or you've been together a long time, and you're like. There have been bad years, right. yeah. you know, like yeah, totally. I, I imagine you talk to someone who's been married for 60 years. There were bad decades. Yeah. They're like, you know, like the the two decades where our kids were where our kids in our house were just the worst. Yeah. You know, like you it changes your time horizon because you've dealt with stuff longer. Right. And so when you're young or you're starting a project, you're like, Man, yeah, like the last like two months, I feel like we've not been making any progress. Yeah. But then, you know, six months later, you had this huge breakthrough. And, and then six years later, that all blurs together. And you don't think about it in terms of like that at all. You yeah. just you just know that's what it took to do what you did. And so I think um, as you do more things, expose yourself to more things and experience adversity and obstacles, you your perspective about that, they're still the same. But your perspective about them is different. And with that, like when you zoom out more, they they by definition sort of shrink. Or when you ex- when you go, am I am I looking at this obstacle in terms of the problem it's, it's going to cause for me in uh, one day? Or am I looking at it in terms of a decade? Right. And now I, it's like it's nothing in terms of a decade. Well, I think that's also just like the opposite of the mentality that's promoted, especially within business these days. It's like month over month growth, you know, like it's like. What are you doing today? Like quarterly earnings. Exactly. So it's like the opposite of what you're put up to. But if you can like think about it in those decades, it's just it's more comforting. Well, I remember I was talking to you about Sarah Gordon once you had this problem with like a business partner, a bunch of stuff. And I go, are you ever planning on selling Sarah Gordon? And you're like, no, I'm going to die here. And I was like, well, that pretty much solves this problem for you. Like that should help change how you think about it, because like. Yeah, if you're building this thing to get to a certain speed uh, by in a certain amount of time to sell it, right. then then you've got a lot you've got to do here. Yeah. If actually there there is no realistic exit here, it's a this is a lifetime commitment you've made. Right. And th- I think you you think about the same thing in terms of marriage or having kids or um, you know a, a calling. Then then you're like, oh, okay, like this is I I need to stop stressing about what this means right now. It only really matters. Does it change the overall trajectory of where I'm going? When you're thinking about Cerro Gordo, then this is a place that's been there for 150 years. Yeah. So the fact that it's, you know, taking you four years to rebuild the hotel is nothing. Yeah, it's a blip on the timeline. I mean, even before that, the area's been there for, you know, millions of years. Yeah, I guess sure. you should think about that timeline. Yeah. But yeah, I'm trying to think of it as a decades project, as the long term horizon. And I think that that it's also honestly I think a part of the resonance of the content and stuff I put out because people are like I think pushing back a little bit against that short term mindset, you know, that tomorrow, tomorrow kind of month over month earnings type situation. And they know this is like a project I've settled in on. And I think it's it's fun to watch somebody settle into something that is kind of like their life's calling. Yeah, I think that's like a appealing thing, no matter what that is. Like I watch, even if that thing's totally different than what you're interested in or your life's calling, just to see someone going after it yeah. is inspiring. Yeah, I've watched people. Like I watch this guy on TikTok that does like marble carving, and he has some business about carving marble. Oh. And I don't care about marble at all or carvings yeah. or statues, but like he's so into it, and he's so like you know, it just like fires me up. And I think like by association i get fired up about whatever i'm going through in the same moment yeah sam i've been following this woman who's like sailing around the world like (laughs) zero interest in sailing, right but like this person's going after that thing and they're They're sharing it it. yeah i think there's like anytime somebody's like fully going for it you can't help but like watch yeah yeah and and i think uh, in terms of being a blip on the timeline to me that's like cerro gordo in little crevices and canyons and I guess there's one sort of planted right there in front of the general store that thankfully didn't burn down. But there's a bunch of trees that are the oldest living things on earth. Yeah, the bristlecone pines. I think that the oldest one is six to 8,000 years old, something like that. It's yeah. called Methuselah, you know, named after. Um, and so these 
pine cones, these trees have been living, not just like existing. They're not just like a rock. Yeah. When you say a rock's been there for a million years, it's hard to be like, okay, but this thing is like breathing and, you know, like yeah. reproducing and continuing on for, you know, way before the stove. It was old when the stokes were around. It was old when, yeah. you know, the Egyptians, it was like, it's- It's um, older than the pyramids. Yeah, it's older than the pyramids. And so the, the thought that this tree has been growing since that time, you know, I, I don't have an illusion that Cerro Gordo in its state as it is, is going to be there for 6,000 years. But like, if the idea of the like, resonance of the town in some way exists for that long then that's like i don't know a pretty cool metric to shoot for yeah i um there's a there's a tree in mckinney state park here that's like one of the oldest trees in texas it's called uh, old baldy and it's 600 years old right you know like so 10 <laughs> percent yeah yeah, yeah. Of, of of the age of like these trees which there are quite a few of yeah but you go like oh this tree was just poking out of the ground as like Shakespeare was writing his plays. Right. Yeah. And it kind of blows your mind to think about. Well, I mean, to your point too, it, it puts everything in perspective. It's kind of like sympathy or we want to describe it as is like, if I zoom out oh, far enough. concept? Yeah, so yeah. concept of sympathy. It's like, am I really, I'm upset about, like I, before this I was upset because my book right now is not available <laughs> in the UK for some yeah. reason. And yeah. I was very upset. And like in 6,000 years, will anything care that the book, you know, no. Yeah. Um, in six days, will I care? Probably not. In six hours, will I care? And so I kind of like use looking around and look at all these old stuff as just a reminder of that. Yeah, there, there's something about understanding that sort of time abides and the earth abides and all our stuff sort of comes and goes. Like some of the people at Cerro Gordo were some of the, like extremely rich. They're totally forgotten. Yeah. You know, uh, People were mad about things, fighting about things, dreaming of things, and like sort of where is all that now? It's yeah. gone. I mean, I think like one of the most profound things that I did that I found early on was that briefcase. So I found a briefcase that's essentially like the entire life of this miner. This I found a briefcase that was full of pay stubs, love letters, divorce settlements, you know, lawsuits, all of these different communications. And like no one's ever heard of this guy, yeah. but he was pretty important at Cerro Gordo and like all of his stuff fits into this tiny little briefcase. And so I started thinking like, what am I leaving in my briefcase? Yeah. That's kind of like an interesting way to think about it. Um, but yeah. Kind of a similar reminder. Yeah. They call those trees witness trees. Yeah. And they think about like what they've seen uh, and experienced yeah. over uh, the years. Yeah. And yeah, they were just there. As I remember we were talking because a couple months ago there was that crazy hurricane yeah. that like hit california in yeah. uh yeah. and filled up lakes in death valley <laughs> but i remember the news reports were like this has never happened right and i remember thinking i bet the bristlecone pines I've would disagree totally. like like not just have seen it before but like dozens Many of times, times. Over, totally. yeah, even, even if this hasn't happened in 500 years <laughs> I've seen it 10 times yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've seen it 10 times over <laughs> yeah that's yeah, wild or or just the fact that yeah like humans have been fight like you think about the battles that have been fought there over by by like tribes that yeah. we don't even remember. Yeah, I mean, there's petroglyphs there that are two to three thousand years old. They're so old that, from my understanding, the historians don't have an exact name for who left them there. Yes, you know, they're like, we, humans did in some capacity. We yeah. don't know who. But, was but so long ago that we've forgotten those humans and their entire yeah, civilization. Exactly, but there's like their paintings are still there on the walls, which. Yeah is just off the property of Cerro Gordo, so it's hard to ignore. Well, and then, so there's those, and then also 100 years ago, someone was uh, writing, and what's that, what's the thing they would write on the walls with? Uh, carbide. Yeah, with carbide yeah. Uh, oil, like just, graffiti. you know. Graffiti. Graffiti yeah. that, that in time will become as old as that yeah. thing. Yeah, it's, I mean, the town is just filled with those types of reminders, and I think being out there is, I don't know, very important in that way. So last thing, talk to me about the memento mori of it. So you, you can look up from your house and see the grave of miners, but you open the book with that line about how most of the miners died at the age you currently are. Like it yeah. was, Cerro Gordo was a place that uh, chewed people up and spit them out. Yeah, it's not like a romantic history. It can be romanticized in, yeah. the, in the future, but like, most of the miners that went up there did not get whatever they were searching for. Yeah. And, you know, I think that I went up there searching for something, probably not, definitely not silver, maybe they were in the way, but like meaning, purpose, fulfillment, you know, some different things like that. And the ending is to be told, you know, I think I've been up there so far, but I've been trying to take it as it goes as like the winds as they come, I guess, the reminders that we're talking about. And the, yeah, to your point, 
it's impossible to not think about day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute, even how is this factoring into, I guess, like my life's work. Is there the memento mori of just like you could be crushed by a falling rock at any moment? I could, I could be crushed by a falling... Entombed underground? <laughs> there are still miners still down in the mines that are entombed. So yeah, I could be crushed at any moment. So I think that like it gives me that urgency. I work pretty long days out there. I try pretty hard to like do what I can for the town when I can. I, although I know that I could be working on it for decades, I don't take that for granted. And I try to do as much as I can every single day. Make sure that the things that I'm doing are things that I, I'm excited about that I think are yeah. important. Well, it's been fascinating. <laughs> it's only just begun. If not terrifying. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I worry about you in there, but oh. I'm, I'm glad the book is out. It's awesome. And uh, I'm glad you're here to actually work for a change. Yeah, I'm, I'm here in person. I'm excited. This is a fun, full circle moment. And I, uh, I have you to thank for a lot of it. So thank you. Oh, my pleasure.